Um, but I, I think also this is a question that interests people in the modern world, people who are Muslim as well as not Muslim. So I wanted to sort of have this particular framework as we sort of go through the, the ages um, of the past and come to a point here in the future and open up for discussion. Um, and I wanted to actually start off by talking about a person who is not Muslim, is not a scholar, but was in fact uh, the very first African-American woman to become an astronaut. Her name was Car May Carol Jemison. Um, and she, I believe she became an astronaut in the 90s, or the, the 80s, a long time ago. And she said that she was inspired to become an astronaut because she saw Uhura on Star Trek. Did I say that correctly? I'm not like a Star Trek or a Star Wars person. But I am very interested in how women and um, sort of marginalized peoples find themselves in the spaces that they occupy. And I found that to be very interesting for several reasons. And one is, you know, sort of this larger narrative that's out there. It is quite difficult for somebody to imagine oneself to be a scholar or to be an astronaut, as in the case of Ms. Jennison, um, if you don't see or hear stories of other people who also inhabit that role, right? And so I think this is actually quite interesting. And I thank the you know, Loyola MSA for inviting me for this particular talk during Islam Awareness Week. I think that Islam Awareness Week is very interesting and you know, something that we did when I was in college as well what oftentimes what it does is it sort of tells two stories or tries to reframe a particular narrative about American Muslims, at least here in the US. And one of that is, one of those stories is an external story, right? So oftentimes Muslims uh, are responding to an external story about Muslims. You know, here, when it comes to the, this, this topic of the legacy of Muslim women scholars, there is this narrative that Muslim women are oppressed, right? In every um, aspect of their lives. We often hear stories uh, that people try to extrapolate when they hear a particular instance in some space that is particular to a geography or a, you know, an individual. And some certain people try to extrapolate and say all Muslims are like this, all Muslims um, uh, oppress women or have a, kind of a, a bad attitude toward women. Um, and so this is kind of a larger narrative, this external narrative that we face as Muslims from the outside community. And oftentimes we, we want to push back on this. And one of the reasons we want to push back on this is, uh, you know, one, we believe that it's incorrect, right? Most Muslims believe that Islam and the various Muslim cultures out there do not, in fact, oppress women, and historically have not oppressed women in a way that you know, at least was um, incompatible with the way women were treated anyway in terms of uh, whatever era that we're talking about. But it also you know, you know, asks the question of, in the modern world, we often you know, have this adage, we believe that a society is as advanced as the most um, literate of its members, right? And so if every member of the society is literate, has access to basic education, let alone higher education, then this society will be able to advance. This is actually a real problem among many of the developing world. Unfortunately, today, much of the Muslim world actually fits into this designation of the developing world, where not only girls, but also boys lack access to good, basic, primary education. And then oftentimes, you know, it's even more skewed into for the girls, where families will focus on educating their boys instead of their girls for a, a multitude of reasons. So there's this external story out there that says that Muslims, um, writ large, historically as well as in modern times, oppress women, don't provide women with the access to education, that Islam is inherently oppressive, that Muslim men are inherently oppressive. And I think Muslims are, are you know, pushing back at this particular story. We're trying to reframe that narrative, and we're trying to tell our own narratives. So I think that's one thing. The other piece of it is looking at the internal stories that we tell, our, that we tell ourselves. Um, 
in the Muslim world, uh, you know, as we saw in this clip uh, a few minutes ago, is incredibly diverse. There are millions of Muslims, tens of millions of Muslims around the world, um, you know, and they're actually concentrated in, you know, Southeast Asia, in fact. Indonesia is the country that has the largest numbers of Muslims. India, which is not a Muslim country, has the second largest number of Muslims, right? Muslims are a minority in India just because the rest of the population is so large. But I believe the number is around 300 million. Any other country would think 300 million. Wow, that's, that's a lot of Muslims, right? Um, and so we are kind of coming around sort of full circle in terms of you know what does it mean to be a Muslim in the modern age? And I think these particular lenses are what I'm looking through when I'm trying to answer this question that I was asked to answer, which is what is the legacy of um, female Muslim scholarship? And I think this is very interesting because we're asking, you know, or we're trying to answer the question of is Islam and are Muslims inherently oppressive to women? Are Muslims inherently, um, you know, do they, do Muslim women lack access to religious education and has that historically been the case? Um, when we're ostensibly talking about Muslim women scholars. Um, and, you know, and women in Islam has always been the sort of contentious issue in the modern age. And I think this is for, you know, the reason that I just mentioned in terms of um, economic development, social development of the, of the national, of the, of the modern nation state. But this comes from the relationship that Muslims have had with the colonial West. And you know, I'm very, I, I try to be very particular and specific when I talk about Muslims and the West. I don't think that there's um, a huge juxtaposition. Obviously, we are, many of us in this room, Muslims, and all of us in this room are living in the West. And I don't think that there's a huge you know, kind of black and white uh, differentiation. But historically, there has been a differentiation between what is known as, quote unquote, the Christian West, which is a Judeo-Christian European um, understanding of identity and uh, the Muslim East, which is very funny because the Muslim East encompasses Africa, the Middle East, the Far East, South Asia, parts of Russia, parts of, in fact, Western and Central Europe. But anyway, um, there's always been this clash. And then when you had in the late 18th, 17th, 18th, uh, and 19th centuries, and, and of course in the 20th centuries, these military and, uh, and political clashes with uh, Western Europe in the guise of uh, colonialism, then you had the second piece. Um, you know, you had something that the Indian philosopher Gayatri Spivak says, you know, the trend of white men saving brown women from brown men. And so, you know, this is, this is quite interesting where you had European men who uh, would justify the process of, of colonialization, of taking other people's lands, demolishing the infrastructure, the educational infrastructure, which will become quite important for our later discussion this evening, demolishing the economic infrastructure, the, um, the trade among the different Muslim uh, communities and countries and kingdoms, and taking over the resources and the political leadership and one of the reasons they used to justify this is that look at these Muslim women living their lives behind the veil. We need to liberate them. And we need to liberate them by what? By just taking off the veils. There was no question of liberating them by offering them any kind of education, whether it was a, a, you know, the traditional religious education or a secular Western education. And in fact, some of these men, such as the British Lord Cromer, and as a Sudanese American, I have this kind of relationship with this guy because he, you know, kind of did some pretty, let's say, amazing things in Sudan. Um, he, in fact, was the president of the anti-suffrage suffrage movement in England, in his home, home country, where he and other elite men worked daily to, to block women's right to vote and at the same time, he was essentially turning around, talking from the other side of his mouth, saying that women in Egypt, in, in um, what is now North Sudan, in um, other parts of the Levantine Middle East, needed the British so that they can be liberated. So 
So these two are a really, I think this is very important when we talk in the modern world about why we care so much about looking at uh, Muslim history of uh, women's uh, Islamic scholarship, re religious scholarship, we're, we're talking about it from this particular framework, which is that uh, today, uh, many Muslim countries do not have even kind of a, a basic advanced education to everybody, every child in their country. Um, a lot of our, a lot of our uh, Islamic educational infrastructures are stagnant. I think, I'm not saying this as like, it's like a radical perspective. I think many people would agree with me that um, kind of after the, the fall of the Ottoman Empire was sort of a, a, a ringing in of uh, a sort of a decline of the modern Muslim world in terms of the economic power and uh, the cultural power that Muslims had traditionally had. Um, and then you had this European um, fixation with quote unquote liberating Muslim women from Muslim men through just taking off their veils, whether they were niqabs, the face coverings, or their hijabs, their head coverings, and not so much focus on, you know, are they integrated in the workforce? Or do they, do they, are they receiving a higher education? Um, are they receiving equal rights under the law, whether it's Islamic law or secular Western law, and so on and so forth. So the reason I'm bringing this up and the reason I'm framing the rest of my talk in this way is because um, you know, I think it's, it's been very interesting in the last 20, perhaps 30 years, this resurgence among Muslims from different uh, ideological backgrounds, whether they are, you know, they would call themselves progressives, whether they would call themselves liberals, moderates, conservatives, or traditionalists, to think about, talk about, research, and publish about the roles that Muslim women had played in terms of developing Islamic law, in preserving and uh, transmitting the hadith, the poetic, um, the poetic teachings, the, the behavior and the sayings of our beloved prophet, peace be upon him, um, the roles of women in developing secular education and promoting secular education in various uh, parts of the Muslim world and throughout Muslim history. And I think this is, it's very interesting because we do need to look at it from this particular perspective. Why has there been such a resurgence in you know, looking for, trying to uncover or unveil, if you will, um, kind of the, the roles that women play? Um, and, and, and I think, I, mean, I don't think it's a bad thing, frankly. Perhaps this is a post, very postmodernist of me, but I think that um, the more sources that we have that we're able to uncover from different backgrounds, from you know, different genders, uh, from different races, different times in the Muslim communities, different uh, geographical areas um, in Muslim history, I think that's the better for us. As I, you know, I think I alluded to earlier, um, the American Muslim community is the most uh, religiously diverse and racially diverse Muslim community in the world. And uh, it is, in fact, the most racially diverse religious community in the United States. I happen to believe that diversity is a blessing. This doesn't mean that everybody should you know, let go of whatever madhab or school of thought that you follow and kind of create this kind of kumbaya, you know, rainbow mixture. But it just means that we are now able, because of telecommunications technology, because of migration, because of the diversity that you see in this room and that you see in Chicago and throughout the country, that we're able to access different um, types of education in a way that our foremothers and forefathers never were able to. Um, and I wish to take advantage of that. I think this is perhaps postmodernist of me, but it is what it is. It's 2014, and I believe that. Um, what I'd like to do uh, now is so, sort of talk, talk a little bit about um, kind of you know some Muslim women in Islamic history, and uh, you know some of you know why they focus on particular aspects of um, of Islamic scholarship. So. Um, so essentially, you know, I would say there's been, uh, in terms of Muslim scholarship, uh, scholarship of Muslim women, primarily they focus on the hadith transmission. And hadith, as I mentioned earlier, are the, um, you know, the prophetic example, the prophetic sayings. And why is that? You know, there's several kind of pragmatic reasons. One is that, you know, some of the other types of Islamic studies, such as law, such as Quranic exegesis, um, you know, Islamic philosophy, you know, that required 
long years of living in a madrasa, which is not a scary word, it's just, you know, an Islamic seminary, uh, long years living away from your family, often in the prime of your life as a young person, and you know, through your 30s, um, and it required uh, often uh, a lot of traveling, and obviously if you're a young woman, this, you know, from traditional societies, this would not do, you know, most young women um, in Muslim communities, in Muslim societies, didn't you know, travel willy-nilly just to uh, search for education. What they did was, um, you know, and I'll backtrack a little bit, um, and say that, uh, you know, while you know, female education was not 100% in every part of, of, the, of the land, you know, throughout Islamic history, uh, but what happened is that elite families as well as middle class families typically did educate the boys and their girls. So if a family had the means to educate their boy, they would educate their girl as well. Um, and so the primary education of both uh, boys and girls often was, you know, by about the first the child was about 10, they would have memorized the Quran, <laughs> mashallah, and uh, would have learned Islam, uh, Arabic grammar and would have been able to, you know, um, learn, uh, you know, kind of you know, some kind of basics in terms of Quranic uh, sort of translation, exegesis, and, and so on and so forth. So this is kind of the basic kind of quote-unquote primary education that children receive. And a lot of the elite families, because there was this kinship, kinship network, so imagine your father is a scholar or your grandfather is a scholar, um, he would teach you himself or he would introduce you or have you sit at the feet of one of his friends or perhaps your grandmother is a, an educated woman, and you would continue to learn from this woman um, more, more in terms of the Quran, Quranic studies, but also specifically around hadith. So why hadith? Hadith, the hadith transmissions, um, and a study of hadith was the important thing in, 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 oh, and I want to also, I wanted to mention this earlier, that I'm speaking from a Sunni perspective and the research that I had done and kind of the, the lay work that, you know, that I had been studying for several years on this subject, oh. <laughs> um, uh, you know, has, has really solely been within the Sunni um, field and that's not because I think that the Shia uh, field is boring or that, you know, there are no women scholars um, Shia, or within Shia history, it just happened that I have to the Sunni scholars. And so um, everything that I'm talking about here happens to be within um, a Sunni framework. And this is quite important as well because, you know, um, many of you know this, but one of the most important transmitters of hadith was the Prophet's wife, Aisha, anha, for Sunnis. And um, she transmitted between, uh, I believe it was between 1,500 to 2,400 hadiths and you know she is the source of many, many, many hadiths that uh, the Sunni community has uh, identified as correct and true, and has then further developed laws and behavior, uh, especially around family, gender, uh, purity, uh, you know, and, and that kind of uh, you know the experiences of like living with the Prophet and seeing how he lived his life in the private sphere. We we take Sunnis take from uh, Aisha. Um, so, <laughs> so, having said that, again, why hadith transmission? It was the only science where you did not have to travel um, so long, right? And you know, a lot of the, the, the people who compiled the hadiths were men, and this was again because they traveled. They would travel to what is now Uzbekistan. They would travel throughout, you know, the Middle East, what is now the Middle East, um, and and. Then they would often, you know, if you're a traveler and not from the area, you would perhaps um, have knowledge of other scholars, but not know them intimately. And oftentimes they would be men, and so then they would, you know, kind of go to male circles, and they would then go on to the next city. And so, in terms of compiling the hadith, uh, you know, these compilers were typically men. But the transmission of the hadith, the person saying, you know, as many of us know. In terms of hadith in Islamic uh, in, in, in Islamic tradition, it is uh, the shortest chain of transmission is the most is the most desired. 
right? And so what happens is that a lot of these girls, young women and girls, after they complete their primary education, they're about 10, 11, 12 years old, their parents would have them you know, study under the local um, kind of hadith you know, scholar, who would typically be a man or a woman who is aged, right? Who would have the shortest chain of transmission. And they would learn from this person, and then that chain of transmission would go to them. So here's a child who's you know, an adolescent who is studying from an elder, and when the elder passes away, this woman would typically then be the only person in that area who has that same cha chain of transmission. So, you know, pragmatically speaking, this is something that works for a lot of um, women's lives because they don't need to travel very much. They're able to marry, have children, raise their children, and then when they grow older, when they reach that age of, you know, kind of elder, elderly status, they're able to pass on um, their education as well as that chain of transmission to other young, younger people, boys or girls. And so this particular, um, this particular method was not only for girls, this was for everybody, but I think it explains why so many women were hadith transmitters. And I mentioned earlier that there was sort of an ebb and flow in terms of um, you know, kind of women's scholarship. And this isn't because men of the time decided that all of a sudden women should not be hadith transmitters or should not be scholars. Oftentimes this was due to out, outside factors. This was due to military conquests by others, the downfall of you know, their particular society. So we can sort of identify four different um, time periods that, that showcase uh, the ebb and flow of women's scholarship, um, or the prominence of women's scholarship in Islamic history. Um, in the first and early second uh, century uh, Hijri, which would go to the sixth or seventh century um, AD, this is the formative period of Islamic, um, of Islamic law, right? And so here you have you know, somebody like uh, Aisha, the wife of the Prophet, or, or Um Salama, another wife of the Prophet, who was transmitted anywhere up to 375 hadiths herself, which is very interesting because Aisha you know, transmitted up to 2,500, and Um who was the next kind of um, co wife to transmit uh, as many hadiths, so hers was drastically uh, smaller to 375. But anyway, the first 50 years, the first sort of generation and a generation after the Prophet's uh, passing, this is the formative year. These are the formative periods. Um, and among the women's, uh, the, among the Prophet's women companions, uh, his wives and the successor generation, the Tabi'at, these are the people who are helping to compile the hadiths. These are the people who um, you know, are in Medina and in Mecca who are saying, well, yes, I heard the Prophet do, say this, or I saw the Prophet do that. Um, and I think this, it's also very interesting to note that there has not been one woman um, uh, transmitter of hadith who has been known or has ever been accused of forgery, which is not the case of uh, men. And I, I don't think this is because women are you know, somehow these magical, spiritual, you know, pure creatures. I think it's because there were so many more men who were transmitting hadith, and as well, you know, the women who were transmitting hadith often had the closest relationship to the Prophet, right? Um, and so they had kind of very direct relationships with him and, and direct examples that they could provide to um, the people around them. The second period we can look at is essentially what we, um, in AD, 7th to 10th century AD, um, and this is essentially a weak period. So after a really strong period of women, um, you know, of women's scholarship now, we've entered a, a weaker period. Um, even, even though this is technically, or you know, sometimes known as quote unquote, the golden age of uh, hadith, because of the male scholars, as I mentioned, who were traveling from city to city to compile the hadiths, for women it wasn't so much, because they weren't doing that. Um, and so, so that's so, so sort of you know, the seventh and the tenth centuries AD. So the tenth and fifteenth centuries AD, so medieval period. Oftentimes, a lot of Muslims will say, "Oh, this is the golden period of you know Islamic history, um, Andalusia, and all of this." Um, here, as you see, the reemergence of 
the Islamic polity, you see the reemergence of the strength of female scholarship. Um, and it's in, in this time period that women achieve the highest level of involvement in scholarship in general, and in any in particular, because as I mentioned, they were still doing other kinds of scholarship, but just the majority of them were in any scholarship. And then um, the fourth period is the 10th, um, uh, uh, sorry, it's the 16th century uh, to right now, the present. And um, so this is like the Memnon period, the early Ottoman period um, until today. And uh, what you see here, obviously nobody's really compiling the Hadiths, uh, I, I don't think, in any kind of mainstream sort of fashion. But what's happening is um, religious education in Islamic seminaries is focused more on legal training and is and you also see a rise of organized Sufism, which I'm not going to talk about too much. Um, but uh, you know, there are certainly circles uh, within um, sort of organized Sufism that allow for scholarship and leadership there. So these are sort of the four kind of eras that, that we we're looking at. Um, and um, I wanted to talk a little bit about you know two kind of books that have been uh, have been making the rounds the last few years. I would say one is by Essen Said, and I recommend everybody to read these, and I'm sure that your library or you know your, your professors here could help access these to you. But um, the book by Said is called Women and the Transmission of Religious Knowledge. And um, what, what's very interesting about this book is that you know oftentimes when we hear about uh, women in Islamic history, we hear small kind of biographical details about them, you know, uh, when were they born, if we can get that, when did they die, what, did, what was their areas of expertise, um, where did they live, but we don't really get past that, and she she gets past that, right, so she, she talks more about um, sort of all the different aspects of the religious knowledge, and she talks um, specifically about hadith, but other, other parts of uh, religious knowledge. <coughs> the other book that I would recommend <coughs> for you guys to look into is by Muhammad Akram Mendri. And he's a Sunni scholar who was based in Oxford, England, and he's a scholar of uh, the science of hadith. And he wrote this book called Al Hadith, which is very interesting because he wanted to essentially, you know, he's writing, he was compiling volumes of hadiths, and he wanted to, you know, maybe spend just look, find a chapter of women transmitters. And as he was doing his research, he found that there was enough to fit 40 volumes. <coughs> so, <coughs> so this book is kind of a compilation of his research into it. The interesting thing, I think, about this book and about his own approach is that he <coughs> Are you asking for questions specifically related to what you just talked about? Yeah, yeah. Are you asking for questions that you sp specifically just spoke about right now? Just questions. Alright, so um, I've been following your um, side and course blog for quite a while now. And I think some of you guys are familiar with this. Can you speak a bit more about it and what you've been doing with it and where you plan on going with that, that project? Mm -hmm. Yes, so um, the blog is a crowdsourced blog on Tumblr. And I asked women as well as men to submit photographs and stories of their experiences in mosques around the world. And it really is about kind of what are the spaces that women occupy in mosques. And um, you know, we look into kind of the beautiful, the adequate, and the pathetic. And the aim of this website is to open a conversation. But we start it online, but we you know kind of take it out to in real life. And 
the, the conversation that I would like people to have is what are the spaces that women and girls occupy in mosques in America specifically because I live here and I care about, you know, I'm invested in this particular community. What are the different ways that different Muslim communities answer this question of how do you segregate men and women during prayer, which um, I think is, is the Bible question, right? I mean, how do we build mosques in a way that um, everybody in the congregation is served by the mosque physically as well as kind of um, you know the services that the mosque provides? What are the, what is the role of the mosque in, in general in the West, which is not the same as the role of the mosque in you know uh, in the traditional Muslim world? And so these particular conversations have been happening. I think. Um, not only catalyzed by the website, but just I think the website has been helping sort of people visualize some of the terrible spaces that women occupy. Um, I received, actually I was talking earlier before the, the session began, most of the submissions I receive are actually in very beautiful spaces. I would say like 65 to 70% of beautiful spaces for women. And you know, and here I'm not just talking about oh, there's a chandelier. I mean, like they're accessible. <laughs> you know, if you have a disability, they are clean. You know that they that they you know offer everything that one needs when you want to pray. And a minority of them are egregiously bad. Like I, I have received photos of a mosque that had mold growing on the walls of a women's prayer space. I've received photos of various mosques that kind of pile garbage or garbage cans uh, in the entrance ways uh, of, of where women enter um, and so on and so forth. And so I've received some feedback and some people say, why are you opening up this can of worms? You're giving fodder for Islamophobes. They already think that Islam treats women badly and here you're showing, you're airing this dirty laundry instead of talking to the, the mosque leaders to ask them and you know, kind of giving 70 excuses to your Muslim brothers and sisters. That's, that's, I don't think that's fair, actually, because you know I'm not like, I'm not the mosque police. I can't go to every single mosque around the, the country and say, okay, like, is it a place for, do you have space for women? Is it clean? You know, um, is there a garbage pile um, um, in the doorway? What is the reason why you know, the space is inadequate and how can I help you? Uh, you know, I don't have limit, you know, unlimited funds to like assist mosques that have legitimate budget reasons for why the women's spaces are inadequate. But what I do have is a platform to just begin the conversation. And I also have, uh, you know, surveys that I, that I refer mosques to take in terms of climate surveys that they can ask, you know, their female parishioners as well as their males in terms of what do you need what are, you know, what are the needs? How can the mosque leaders meet them? What I can do is meet and talk with people from ISNA and the ISFU and look at this national picture. You know, how can mosques who, you know, there are several mosques or types of mosques in America that have excellent spaces for women um, as an ideology. And these are traditionally, typically there's um, three types, one is uh, the African American Sunni mosques that are related to Imam Malik al Din Muhammad community. Another is the Bosnian origin mosques. And then the third is the uh, Ithna Ashari, the 12 Ber Shia mosques, whether they're Arab or South Asian. All three of these mosques, or types of mosques, have equitable, equal spaces for women. And some of them, women even pray in the same space as men behind the men. Um, without a partition. And so how can other Muslim communities around the country learn from what other communities are doing? This isn't to say um, that everybody should erase their differences and people should, you know, I am going to force my preferences on mosques. I mean, my preference is quite, I'm very vocal about it, which is that I believe that men and women should be praying in the same space, men in front, women in the back with no partition, which as many of you will recall is the Prophet's mosque in his lifetime. So this is just straight from the Sunnah. But I'm not going to force people who want to have a barrier, who want to have a partition, to do so. 
what I'm asking is for MOCs to one, identify the fact or prioritize equal access to sacred space for women, and then to do it in a way that makes sense for their congregation. <coughs> Yeah, I'll follow up on that. Yeah, sure. So this like partition issue, sorry, I just kind of see that. But this partition issue comes up a lot. Um, and you obviously have like people who are very for or very against it. And this seems to be like an issue that has, I mean, I don't want to say fair, but it has like liberal voices on both sides mm -hmm. who have valid points. Are there any like theological or practical things that at least us the this generation can do to have a more equitable space for men and women? Because oftentimes youth don't have a huge say in like domestic politics. Yeah. So what is it that our generation can somehow do to progress more in a direction yeah. where everyone can feel comfortable and safe in the That's a really great question, and it's a question that so many people are thinking about too. Um, I think many of you have heard of this film called Unmasked, and then there's this sort of counter kind of movement called Remasked. And I think both of these are very interesting. Like, I think we all have to talk about them um, in, in both, you know, kind of why are there third spaces that are rising up. I don't know if many of you go to attend the Tatlib classes that are, that happen once a month out in American Islamic College, but that's an example of a third space of a Muslim religious community having religious classes, praying together, you know, you know, kind of supporting each other as a religious community, but outside of a mosque structure. This kind of third space is popping up <coughs> everywhere around the country. Um, and a lot of people say, well, okay, don't do that outside of the mosque, do that in the mosque. Personally, I think that is the most, um, that, that should be the ideal, is to, to take this third space, or the, the fervor that goes into creating a third space, like Ta'lif, or like, you know, other, um, other spaces like that, and bringing it into the actual physicality, the locality of a mosque. For me, that's the most ideal situation. Why? Because I personally believe that mosques in America, anyway, are not just places to pray, but they're community centers. There's the only, they're often the only space where Muslims um, can meet together and be in community with each other as Muslim. They're often the only place where Muslims and non-Muslims and interfaith neighbors can learn about Islam. They're often the, the place where people go to if they're looking to get married or if there's janaza burial services. You know, it is community-oriented anyway, and if you are thinking about that as a community-oriented space, you have to think about it as being holistic. And you have to ask yourself, not you personally, but mosque leaders have to ask themselves, um, am I serving every member of my community, right? And as they look around and they say, okay, does everybody who attends this mosque, do they look like me? That's somewhat of a problem, I think. If you live in the most racially diverse, you know, Muslim community in the world. Um, there are mosques in Chicago that don't let women in, and I think that's insane. Like, I really think that's insane. I haven't called the police on them, but, but I certainly, you know, I, I, mean, I don't know what to do about it. So I think that what young people should do is to remain engaged, and it's so hard, and, and I'll be very honest, and I have gone through this ebbing and flowing period myself, where, you know, I used to be on board with the mosque. I am, um, for full disclosure, I grew up in Bridgeview. I grew up attending the Mosque Foundation of Bridgeview, and now I live in Orland Park. I do not attend the, the mosque in Orland Park because I am a part of this unmosked, kind of third space type of a person. Um, when I go to Salat al I usually go to Iman, which is like 45 minutes away from my house, but that's just because oftentimes the sermons are just a lot more relevant for me than whatever sermon is happening at the mosque five minutes down. The street from my house. However, having said that, um, I think that you know there were periods in my life when I was a teenager um, where I was engaged with the mosque, and they actually you know were positively engaging me as well. One example I can give is that um, that mosque in Bridgeview used to only give their khutbas in English or sorry in Arabic, and um, I actually attended Aqsa School, which is an all girls Islamic school. Uh, out in Bridgeview and was based in the mosque for actually when I was there. Um, and, you know, one of my friends, you know, was telling me, you know, I, I like, you know, so Friday prayers were really great because we had kind of a short day. It was awesome. At like 12 o'clock we were done with classes. And one of my friends
parents, his daughter of Palestinian immigrants, uh, not immigrants, her parents are Palestinian, but her grandparents came from 48. So her parents grew up in America. They didn't know, they really didn't know Arabic very well. She <coughs> certainly didn't know Arabic. When the sermons were talking, you know, when uh, Sheikh Jamal would give the sermons, it was only in Arabic, in Arabic fusha, so modern standard Arabic. And it was very difficult for her to understand it. It was sometimes difficult for me to understand it. And what we did was we actually wrote him a letter, right? And we were like, listen, like we're young people and we can't really understand you all the time and we'd like to. And can you just translate um, your khutbahs? And I remember like thinking, he's just gonna ignore it. I mean, Shem Jamal has this like kind of stereotype that like he just will just ignore it. He just does his own thing. Um, but he actually read the letter at the next Friday prayer. And he read it out loud. And we said, okay, from now on, we're going to we're going to translate the khutbahs. And that has been the case. And not only that, but now um, their monthly lectures, all of their lectures actually are in English. They do have some Arabic <coughs> lectures, but they always have English lectures as well. It's not because of me in Mecca, but that experience, what that experience did is it allowed me to think, okay, like I can engage with the most powerful person in my mosque. Um, and sometimes the, that response is not like that. But I think young people, you know, I don't know how many of you are commuters versus live here, but you're, either way, you're still in a bubble. You're still kind of, you know, in college, some of, you, some of you work as well, and like you're not necessarily always thinking about what's happening in, in the mosque that you grew up in, but you do have to remain engaged because one thing that as our elders would grow older, they realize that they need younger faces in the room. And I personally have seen, and I've worked with, um, CIOGC, I was a staff member at the Council of Islamic Organizations of Greater Chicago for a while, and you know I have seen that there's been a sea change among the leadership themselves. You know, we're thinking, okay, um, you know, how can we serve more people? And one thing as well is, you know, for all people, men or women, boys or girls, is to arm yourself with Islamic history. And so when I speak with, to um, to, to mosques, and I do a lot of work with them on mosque inclusion, and do workshops as well as sort of like lectures. I always, you know, come at me, I always talk about this hadith, often I begin with it or I end with it, which is the, you know the, the hadith of the Prophet. So I said that who said, you know, um, he is not among my community who does not respect the elders nor is kind to the young, right? And so I mean, just knowing that this is in our tradition, that young people do have to respect their elders. The elders do have to be kind and be conscious of the needs of the young. Is something that you know essentially arms us to be able to engage with people in the mosques. Yeah. Um, I guess you did kind of touch on this, but um, unfortunately, like today, the importance of women scholarship in Islam is very like shut down. So how can we, as like the new generation, the fifth gen, modern generation, change that? Cool. So this is great. I mean, some of your questions are actually coming back to like what I um, have been wanting to, to talk about. So um, essentially what we see today as well is that there is, one, there's access in a way that there has never been access before to different types of Islamic knowledge. So not just hadith you know, uh, scholarship, but also Islamic law, Quranic exegesis, just even Quranic memorization, receiving hijazas, uh, for the different types of numbers, they are different types of recitation of Quran, and there are court, there are classes everywhere. So oftentimes, what happens um, is people in the West will study abroad. You know, a lot of people used to study in Syria, but you know they'll study in Pakistan, India. They'll study in Yemen and Tariq. They'll study you know wherever in Jordan, and they'll come here. Um, but uh, they'll come back, and what I always you know. Um, really admire of some of these people is that then they continue their education in the secular world, still in Islamic studies. And so you have these sort of what I would call unaffiliated, right? So they're not really affiliated with like the, the Tarim or organization of like Habib Ali al Jindri. They're not necessarily affiliated with the Qubaysiyat movement, which I wanted to mention earlier. Um, and the Qubaysiyat movement is one of the most important movements of Islamic studies. Um, in the 20th century, it was started in Syria in the 1960s by a woman um, named Munira Qubaisi, and she's from Damascus, and she is the founder of this order, essentially, it's a quasi-Sufi, I would 
USA, and what they do is they offer like classes to women and girls in Syria, and actually this has become an international movement um, in Islamic studies. So uh, in Quran and memorization and um, and exegesis and other types of Islamic studies. And what they do is again that chain of transmission that I mentioned earlier with Hadith. This is something that is in Islamic studies. It's like who was your teacher? Who did she study from? Who did he study from? What is that chain of transmission? And this is what the Qubaisi movement offers to women and girls around the world. Um, and before the, the current war in Syria, they enrolled um, a, a, about 75,000 students in Syria. That, that is known. And so, I mean, this is amazing. And this is just, just in that time period. So imagine like from the 1960s onward, right? Um, and then though their students teaching other students and so on and so forth. So you also have um, people who are kind of unaffiliated. And uh, again, these are people who will take um, from traditional scholars in the traditional Muslim world and then come to the United States or Canada or South Africa, wherever they're from, and continue their secular education. And, um, and I would recommend, uh, that has not been my trajectory, but I would recommend if this is something that you're interested in, is to, to do that and to talk with your professors um, and talk with me. I can suggest some people to you, including my friend, um, Dr. Tabiyad Salim, who you know received her doctorate last year from the University of Chicago and is now working at Harvard Seminary. And her focus is on Islamic scriptures and the law. There's Asif Qureshi, who is a professor of Islamic law and gender out in, um, in Madison, Wisconsin. There's Maria Shivani, a young woman who is doing her PhD in Usul al fiqh in you know, Islamic jurisprudence and the law at the University of Chicago right now. There is you know, Ingrid Maxson, who, who you know, is a professor of Islamic studies and interfaith studies, and who has always, in my experience, been open to mentoring and working with young women as well as young men who want to you know, kind of join this particular trajectory. So. Any more questions? Thank you. 
oftentimes, a lot of these women had been unknown to us in history because, you know, although Muslims had always known that there were these great Muslim women scholars because all of the, you know, the, the, the originators of the four Islamic schools of law were taught by women and often taught by many women. We'd always known that they existed. But there was always this um, feeling of separation. You know, hijab actually literally means separation. So unfortunately, we don't have like a time machine. We can't go back to see, you know, how was the, the actual gender relationship between um, a teacher and a student, if the teacher was a woman and the, and the student was a man, or vice versa. Um, we know that these women observed some form of hijab. Did they observe niqab? We don't know. And um, is this hijab, you know, a hijab like I'm wearing a scarf, or was it actually a, a, a barrier, a partition? And this is this is actually important, not because of, you know, I'm interested in it, which I'm interested in it, you know, how, where did they sit, you know, where were they? We know that there were women who taught publicly, who taught, you know, in, in the Prophet's mosque publicly, you know, in, in public spaces. We know that there were women who opened up their homes um, for communities of scholars to come to learn from them. But also, we know that, you know, in hadith thread, this is like super obscure, but in some hadith transmissions, um, you know, the hadith itself was almost, uh, this is really irre irreverent to say, but it's almost like a kind of a charades, <laughs> right? Where like you say the full hadith, but then you actually have to act something out, right? And so there are stories of like the, the teeth, like you have to act out like holding the beard to like show like how long a beard should be, you know, and, and you know, kind of these sorts of examples. And so, you know, there are stories of, wi of women teachers doing that, so the question is, okay, were they wearing niqab and they're holding the beard? Or are they not wearing niqab? Like, uh, clearly the, the teacher and the student were in the same room. If the male student is saying, oh, my teacher did this because he saw this happen, right? But um, I think it's really important to note that there, had, there was uh, always this observation of gender dynamic um, and gender um, interaction. And Muhammad Akhtar Nidli, who I mentioned earlier, who wrote and Muhammad, who's the Hadith scholar out of Britain, you know, he focuses on this a lot. And he actually asks his readers to not use a, a, what he is describing as a feminist framework to read his book. Because he's saying these women were not feminists, they were just Muslim scholars. And um, what they did it wasn't necessarily, you know, feminism. And, and it should not be read from a feminist framework. So today, as in this sort of postmodern world where we're where we, most people inherently believe that it is important to educate boys and girls, it is important to have, for um, boys and girls to have equal access to education, to religious knowledge, to you know, pathways to God, you know, these questions are it's really important. And they come back to us, and we, and we won't ever know. It's not like we'll ever be able to have you know, that, that time machine, unfortunately. It's unfortunate because I would love to meet some of these women, and one of them is Amr bin Abdul. Um, she um, was one of the greatest scholars among the second generation of the early Muslims. And uh, if you'll recall, you know, this is sort of one of the more dynamic periods um, of female scholarship. She was a jurist, a mufti, and a mufti is somebody who gives legal opinions. Fatwa is just a legal opinion, it's not a scary word. Um, she was a hadith scholar, and she lived under um, the Umayyad uh, Caliph Omar bin Abdul Aziz, who encouraged it. Caliph encouraged people to study with her. Um, Aisha bin Saad ibn Abi Waqqas, she was a jurist and scholar who taught um, many famous Muslim men, and uh, one of the more, most famous ones, or more famous ones, was Imam Malik, the founder of the Maliki School of Thought, which many uh, Sunnis follow. Um, <coughs> Sayyid bin Nasisa, the daughter, the, the great granddaughter of the Prophet, was upon him was in fact a teacher of Islamic jurisprudence, uh, whose students traveled to study with her. And one of her students was Imam al-Shafi, another founder of one of the four Sunni schools of thought. And then she actually financially supported him later in life as well. So you see, you know, these are women who often, through kinship, through their financial kind of backgrounds, are able to pursue lives of education, and they're able to kind of move in these very elite circles. Um, 
are so many other people I think would benefit from this, actually. Um, I also wanted to talk about uh, other types of kind of important people, somebody who opened up kind of the, the, the world or opened up the world for people to study. And these are, you know, Islam has always had a history of philanthropy and like um, and being benefactors. And so you uh, one of the most well known, I would say, is Fatima al Bayriya who was a woman who lived uh, in today's Morocco. Um, and she started uh, the, the great school of uh, Baydawan in the ninth century, which exists to this day. And is in fact, people believe is the first kind of, or is the longest functioning university. And so um, they offered um, secular sciences. And in fact, uh, Jewish and Christian theologians would come from Spain and parts of Southern Europe to study. Uh, at her school, which was uh, you know, had a mosque uh, connected to it, the hospital, but was supposed to be you know a school. And she uh, and her sister as well, who her sister founded the Cordoba Mosque, Cordoba Mosque. They essentially they inherited their money from their father, and they wanted to give back to their community in this way. So as one sister built a mosque, the other sister built a university, which exists to this day. This is from the ninth century, which is amazing. Um, Another uh, person is Queen Zubeda, who was the wife of uh, the, the Caliph Harun al Rashid in the 9th century in the Abbasid dynasty, a very kind of well known Caliph. So his, his wife herself, she, um, when, she, what she did was she kind of built, um, the, provided for pilgrims who were on their way to Mecca, so she built roads and dwellings and kind of guest houses for them. And she also had essentially what we would know as salams. Essentially, people would come to the palace, I suppose, and kind of exchange ideas. And she was clearly a well-learned woman herself, and opened up that space for, for kind of the elites and the, 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 the I don't know the literati of, the, of that community to share their thoughts as well. Um, <clears throat> and then you have uh, Rana Shah Arumia, who was from the 11th century and in Baghdad. She restored schools, bridges, public housing for homeless women. Um, and then she had her own school in Damage. And, and then uh, Fatima of Cordoba, who was a librarian in the 10th century in Spain, oversaw the building of 70 public libraries containing 400,000 books. Um, a little closer to our time period is Nana Asma'o bint Danforio. This was from the 18th century in what is now Nigeria. And uh, her father was the caliph of, um, of that particular caliphate in West Africa. And she and he was very committed to education for boys and girls, and she was a product of that herself. And she became herself a legend um, to inspire women as well as men who would come and study with her. Um, and she was uh, fluent in Arabic and Hausa and other languages, and, uh, and she was a prolific writer as well. And, um, and she, you know, th this is somebody who, whose legacy remains, I mean, even though it's just couple hundred years ago, it's still what you, uh, a lot of libraries and roads and what have you in Nigeria are named after her to this day. Um, and so, you know, kind of, um, I wanted to go go over some of these names with you. Some of you um, might be familiar with some, uh, some of you might not be familiar with these names. And this is really, it's just a, a fraction of the amazing women that we know of and a fraction of the amazing women that we do not know of in Islamic history um, in terms of the scholars. So earlier I began by saying that, or trying to frame it in a way that says that Muslims are trying to change the particular narrative. And based on your question, I you know, got toward the, the, the point in, in my talk that I wanted to say that, you know, um, Muslims are not just concerned with framing the narrative, right? We're also concerned with writing their own narratives. Okay. Excuse me. And that includes um, kind of opening up the space for women and men to um, to become experts in the fields of different fields of Islamic studies. And uh, what's really important now is that, you know, although you could say kind of dynastically that Muslim communities around the world are kind of at a low point, what we have now is access to a lot of, you know, our previous uh, uh, bodies of scholarship through social media or, I don't know, social media, but telecommunications.
communications technology, that opens up a lot. Um, my mother teaches Tajweed, but when she was receiving her hijazah for Tajweed and for Hifas, she was learning from a lady in Egypt who she never met. Well, it was Skype every day. And so like, this is something that opens up while social media and tel uh, you know, has, um, technical telecommunications technology, on the one hand, I think can be dangerous because it can distort the importance of certain trends, right? Um, oftentimes you see in social media or like on YouTube, and you want to just look up, you know, Muslim women scholars, you'll hear or you'll 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 yield a lot of information that is on the margins, right? About queer studies, about you know, different kind of geographical regions that are not necessarily you can't really extrapolate into other trends. Um, such as the female imams in China, they only, you know, they have, they've developed their own kind of imam network among females in China, but they only minister or lead prayer to other women. Um, and now you see some women saying, oh, let's do that in America, but it's a completely different context. And so on the one hand, social media kind of skews the importance of some of these sorts of trends. On the other hand, it opens up for the possibility for people to learn from each other, to learn about each other, Right, to learn about those female imams in China, for example, and to be able to teach each other in a way that you know our four, four parents were not able to. So here ends you know my formal part of my conversation that I wanted to share with you. I um, wanted to thank you guys for bearing with my coughing and my low voice and, and what have you. But this is such a critical topic, I think, for for men and for women. Um, and yeah, I want to end actually with a quote by Habib Ali. A Jifri, who I referred to a few times in my talk, who you know um, is a very well-known Sunni scholar from Tamim uh, in Yemen, and you know is direct uh, is a direct relation, um, a descendant of the Prophet, peace be upon him, and you know he said that uh, in a talk on the importance of female scholarship, he said that having female scholarship restores divine balance because God created uh, male everything in pairs. And if we don't fulfill this balance, we won't get the fruits of the divine balance. And so I want to just end with that particular quote and have you guys think about, you know, how is it that men and women can support each other here on this campus, when you leave the campus, when you go out in, in the world, um, in order to keep that balance restored and to constantly improve your own understanding of that the author of the work of Hajjah Fat prefaced his, um, his work saying that people should not read it in a feminist framework. Yeah. And one of the reasons that I can imagine for that is there's a lot of um, thought and talk about feminism in Islam and how that might be either inherently tied to Islam or inherently against Islam. And coupled with that, um, not too long ago there was remarks by a certain scholar um, that were that were perceived as very misogynistic. And so many of the scholars who came out in opposition to him, they also prefaced their statements by saying that we are in opposition to these comments, but they are also in opposition to feminism mm -hmm. and the feminist feminist trend in Islam. Can you comment on how, like, what is feminism in Islam? Why is there this negative, um, you know, energy? Why is this negative, like, talk around it? Yeah, yeah. 
Should I use that? Should I? Oh, whatever you'd like. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> So there are actually uh, a lot of mosques in America that don't let women in at all. So I think that's a problem. Uh, you know, um, there's a, a very well-known kind of tradition that says, "Do not prevent, you know, God's women, God's slave women, Fima Ida, from God's mosques, from misogyny. That that not Fima Ida means misogyny, right? So that goes against tr the prophetic sayings. It goes against the prophetic traditions. It goes against our understanding." Um, to say that women should not enter our mosque at all. Having, so that's, that's one, <laughs> but that's just one of them. The other piece of it is that um, there are some spaces that are actually quite inadequate. I mean, to have mold growing on the walls, to have a space, um, there's a particular mosque here in Chicago where the men and the women's spaces are completely separate. The women's space doesn't, is 
not even connected through audio to the men's space. So if you are in this particular area and you want to pray Asr or Maghrib or whatever, you can't pray Jama'ah with the men. The women pray separately from the home, and the men pray Jama'ah. As Muslim, I believe Jama'ah is better than praying on my own. Um, and then also, it's, it's, for me, it's not even really about form, it's more about function. So how many times have the women in this room been in a mosque um, and uh, you are praying behind the imam and either there's a sajda in the middle of the salah and he forgot to mention or the audio cuts off and you're like, oh, where, like, what rak'ah are we on? And you don't even know, I, right? I mean, it happens. So it's not about the chandelier. It's not about, oh, I want to enter the nice, pretty entrance. It's about, is my prayer like, you know, valid, <laughs> you know? And so, so that's, that's what I'm interested in. Oh, no problem. Levels of prayer spaces. 
in that mosque, women are still in the basement. And, and this is my thing. Um, there are valid reasons for there to be, um, oh, you know, for lack of a better word, better spaces for men. One, it is fudded for men to, to offer their prayers in the mosques, and it's not fudded for women to do so. Um, many mosques have budget issues, right? And therefore, they're going to prioritize the fudded over the um, you know, unwanted. However, um, if you are creating a mosque experience that only caters to men, that's a problem. Um, women will have and will walk away not necessarily from their religion, but certainly from their community. And that is not like that divine balance that Habib Ali was talking about. Did you want to say something? Or yeah, and it's just had a comment <coughs> um, where, for example, me, I live in a community that has no mosque, not yet. Um, but mashallah, there is a working center. And mashallah's sister is like a very big, big donor um, to go get the mosque. And she wants to be on the board of like, you know, the people that are um, making the Do you know that the inherent like thought that they're having is like, oh she's a woman, like, you know, like how are we gonna accommodate for her? Because it's she's like the only woman on the um, male board, but some people are like, well, she's a big donor. And a lot of people are saying, no, no, just because she donates the money doesn't mean she gets to make decision, decisions. But um, a lot of the conversations that I was having with my family is like, well, wouldn't it be wonderful to have women on like these boards where the initial start off of the mosque is so that they can represent that female view. But then how does that, you know, like how do you well it's, it's a comment because I could hate this, you know, like being egalitarian or anything like fucking so you know. But um, you know, it's it's so sad where people are just like they just have this mentality sometimes where it's like, well, male and females can't like be on a board together or especially for a mosque or something. Um, and I think I think hopefully our community will change and hopefully she does um, is successful in getting on that board. But it was just something that I'm seeing right now as a progression. And I was arguing with my dad, but I'm like, if, if you know, maybe you should side with her if she wants to be on the board and vote for her to be on it, just so that we as women um, do have a voice um, in this um, production of yeah. Okay, so a couple of things. So I don't know. Yeah, no, I would recommend everybody here you can download this. Um, Isma had a study from 2011 called the uh, Isma Mosque Study or the U.S. Mosque Study, um, and they studied essentially mosque inclusion about women. And I think, you know, don't quote me on on the statistics, but I think it's like something like 80% of the incorporated mosques in America allow women to be on the board. So your the, the mosque is kind of an aberration, first of all. So they should think about that. And something about 60% of mosques actually have women on the board. This isn't to say that there's majority women on the board. It isn't necessarily to say that women are necessarily going to advocate for other women. Um, but the fact is that you know the majority of American mosques have women on the board or are able to have women on the board. And, um, and, and that's, really, that's, that's really very important. And I'll give the example of the mosque down the street from my house. Um, it's a very beautiful mosque, the Orland Park Prayer Center. Um, but it's very clear that there's no woman on the planning committee. This is something that I always tell uh, mosques when they when they ask me. You know, it's that maybe it's not the board exactly, but certainly you should have women on the planning committee. Because th this is a $5 million mosque, because mashallah, it's, a, it's quite a, a wealthy community uh, and very generous. And it's huge. And the kitchen is not an industrial sized kitchen. Right, so for Safood and Ramadan and all sorts, they have to like import, like uh, kind of what's the word? Cater, cater food as opposed to creating their, their cooking their own food. The bathrooms are single stall, are single stall bathrooms, which is kind of insane in a mosque that caters to hundreds of families. Um, there is no babysitting room. There is no babysitting room. <laughs> there, you know, women with children have to sit in what is essentially the lobby. So anytime a woman comes from outside and opens a door, you hear this like cacophony of children crying, they're like watching TV or they're crying or they're yelling, and then your futura is done because nobody thought to build a babysitting room. There's no room for women who are nursing or have babies and, and want to pray like, other, like many other mosques do. I mean, and this is clearly because nobody on the planning committee even asked his wife 
like what what would be you know relevant to our important for women to do. Um, and I think it's in this day and age when you have women architects of mosques, when you have the majority of American mosques having women on the board or or allow women to be on the board, it does not make any sense to not ask women their input, especially if they're funding the mosque. What is it? <laughs> oh, she was just saying what you said. Yeah, yeah. And also look at, look, look up that um, that study. You can download it from. It's just like Google. And it's not like Mosque Survey 2011. Yeah, um, I guess kind of going off of something that's really been coming up. I guess it is just mitigating that fear of like the loss of the app. I guess um, mm -hmm. it's something we struggle with as well. And if you are a member of the board, you. You have this fear that, oh, I, I am going to be talking to others, so like, am I going to lose the level of hair that I want to do that? Mm -hmm. So I guess it's just kind of overcoming that fear. And um, I don't really to do it, so I guess that's our hesitation in joining them. Yeah. I think it's very important to understand like, what is public behavior. So hijab is not, so obviously hijab is for men and women. It's not just the outward clothing, it is the behavior. Um, but what I find, and, and every Muslim should be able to behave with one another and with other people with adab, with the adab that comes with you know, having and observing this hijab, this kind of larger hijab. What I find very interesting is some of, and not you necessarily, but like a lot of uh, people who say, you know, men and women should not work together in the mosque, or oh gosh, young people should never work together in like youth activities. They don't seem to have a problem, you know, when their kids have, um, you know, friends of the other gender in school or have to work with them for science fair projects, or if they are themselves working in a mixed gender environment among non-Muslims, doing secular things. And there's no problem there. And, and I, I actually don't think that there's a problem there if you're observing the, the proper etiquette and in interaction. But some of these same people say, oh, but it is a problem to do it within the framework of a mosque or a youth center or something like that. And I just think that that's just so unrealistic. Frankly, that's the, um, that's the Bridgeview kind of modality itself, you know? Um, it's highly, gen you know, highly gendered, highly segregated. It works for some people, it doesn't work for others, and I think that it doesn't prepare anybody, like especially people your age, when you graduate from college and you enter, inshallah, the workforce or graduate school, like it's not gonna prepare you to in interact normally with professors or bosses or colleagues of the other gender. And so I think this is also part of tarbiyah. It's also part of raising um, well-bred, if you will, you know, young Muslims in America is how do you interact with people of the other gender? How do you interact with people of other faiths? Um, how do you interact with people, uh, other Muslims um, from different, you know, sectarian backgrounds? And I think it's, it's we have that opportunity in a way that you know a lot of us you know from our quote unquote home countries didn't have. Um, we have that opportunity to do that now. We have the opportunity to behave in a way and to kind of um, you know enact our Islamic sensibilities in a way that our cousins or uh, you know people that you know we know from quote unquote back home do not have. So that, that's that's my perspective. That's a bit of something. To say. I want to thank you guys um, for being really attentive. I know this is a busy week for you, um, and your finals are going to start in a few weeks. I want to thank you again for the invitation to Yada and Sujood and all of you. Um, the, this was, as I mentioned um, in the outset, you know, it's, it's, it's a topic that I'm personally interested in and have done kind of lay study into. Um, but then I also did some extra study just to just to come here and talk to you guys about it. It's something that does not end, right? I think it. Um, there's a hadith that says, you know, you you should uh, go out and you know pursue an education even if it means you have to go to China. Well, we don't have to go to China to do that today. We could to go to Google and uh, look things up. Um, and it was it was actually really incredible for me to sort of look at some of even the, the new scholarship that's arisen. Um, and I wanna suggest to you guys to continue to, to study this or think about these questions. 
uh, in the future, and then contact me. I'm kind of everywhere on social media. Um, contact me if you have any questions or thoughts. I'm not a scholar of this. I'm like you, like a student of it. But I can certainly connect you with my friends who are PhDs, who are professors, um, and, and who are you know, kind of chairs of departments if you're interested in pursuing that academically. And I will, because I believe in promoting edu Islamic education wherever it is. And um, yeah, and, and also please take pictures for me of your prayer space post that on site after it, so just say <laughs> awesome and the men too. Thank you. Thank you again, Sister Hint, um, for answering all our questions and having answers for them. Um, so as you guys know, it's IAWD. Tomorrow will be day four, and tonight we're, have, we're hosting the Hijabi Marmalots at 8 p.m. So please join us for this live performance as we journey into the soul of the American Hijabi. So we'll compliment exactly what Sister Henry is talking about. I hope to see all of you there. And tomorrow we'll be continuing with sharing a meal with our neighbors at 12 o'clock in Dayton NPR. And then we'll have a lecture titled, And I, My Neighbor's Keeper, um, with Evan DeRoyo, who's a licensed uh, licensed social worker and he's been incredible since then. So inshallah, I'll see you guys there. And there are more refreshments in the back, so help yourselves. And just a reminder that it is Asa Prime for those who stay.